We've all had to make changes in our lives. We've all had to do things in our life that we know is wrong. And we had to change that because it was just leading just this led to this problem and then it led to another problem and it led to another problem. And until we changed our way, that problem never went away. You can't blame God for that. You can't blame God. We did it. He didn't. But at the same time, we have to remember of a blessing that may have come that we overlooked. There were many things. When my aunt first sent me that poem after my son had passed away, it took me a while to sit down and read it three, four, or five times and then put it all into perspective. There was this poem that nobody knew who, who wrote it. My uncle carried it. It was, it was published in a newspaper. My uncle carried it for years. He passed away two years before the twins were even conceived. But that poem went forth for other people. It, it's in three different churches right now that they have photocopies of it, and they have the whole concept of how it came to pass and how I came to get it. And they use this to bring to other parents who are losing or have lost a young child. Which we're not wired for it. We're not wired for it, ladies and gentlemen. We're just not. But something happened. God allowed things to happen the way they happened. And now this poem goes forth. And this poem, I, many people have heard it. You know, it, it's a meeting. It's a meeting between an angel and God. And the angel is explaining of a child that will be, needs to be born onto these parents. This child will be handicapped. This child's life needs to be content. So please be careful of where this child is sent. They were a plea to God to send this disabled, handicapped child to the right parents who would protect this child and make this child's life content, no matter how long he had. And it's God's special gift. I'll tell you, it, it, turned, this, it turned this sinner around. It turned this sinner around. I could not deny it anymore. I couldn't. I could not deny it anymore. And I had to change. So on that, ladies and gentlemen, on this second half tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're going into Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 is, it continues on where we just were. But we there's a new theme here. We had heard in the past of Daniel and Daniel's vision. When Daniel was having the visions and he came forth at the end and, and he tells the 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 spirit, the, the angel that is bringing this forth onto him that I, I read this and I see this, but I do not understand. So, and they said, well, don't worry. The book is sealed. Seal it up, send it off. That, that's for the end time. You won't be here. Now, could this be the book God spoke of? Could this be the book that the spirit brought forth to Daniel and said, no, seal it up. Is this the book that is sealed? There's seven seals. We don't know. And that is insignificant. It's a sealed book. That's all it is. It's a sealed book. There's a lot of significance within this seal. There's a lot that goes on to man within this. And I think a lot of what today this represents has been misrepresented in society as a whole. Because there's many things going on here. Remember, we've come to a point in time that God has had it. It's the end of a time. Man has totally reverted themselves right back to the time of what? Noah? When they had 120 years to build an ark and say, well, I'm taking it all out. People had 120 years to repent and turn of their ways, and they chose not to. We saw that again in the time of Moses. 
the Israelites, they were they were delivered from bondage, and they were brought to the promised land, and they still refused to adhere to God's law. And what happened? They were forced to wander the wilderness for 40 years until all that had reached their 20th birthday and above had perished. But treat or teach your children the truth, and they shall have the promised land. So there we go. That's, this is where this all comes about. So when you come into today's, look at what's going on today. And so much of this stuff that's happening is now coming to pass. Every cause has an effect. Everything that you do in your life affects something else. Every happening in our world affects something else else it just does not come randomly cause and effect and there are consequences for your actions you do not go out here and shoot somebody in in broad daylight in front of everybody and think you're going to get away with it that ain't going to happen your action took that life, and the, the effect of that action is now you're arrested, you're in trial, you're going to jail or the death sentence or whatever man wants to do to you for your actions. Well, God sees it the same way. There are consequences to your actions. We are not to judge others' actions. That's God. And it is hard for us. As humans, it's hard for us not to judge our fellow man without judging ourselves. That's where a lot of this comes to play of what we're dealing with today and the persecution of the people in the church and stuff of today is because of just that, ladies and gentlemen. They are trying to make us judge ourselves compared to that of another. We are supposed to not speak out against another without speaking out against ourselves when if we stand up in public and declare, I am a sinner. I am a sinner and I need to repent of my way. And your sin is this that God has brought forth in his word and he has commissioned all his Christians to say this unto you. This is your sin and you must repent of this sin. Just as somebody will tell me, hey, this is your sin. You must repent of that sin. Okay, thank you. And that's how it works. But we're not being allowed to do that today, ladies and gentlemen. We're not being allowed to work together as human beings. But now, here again, and hopefully this will work. I think it shall. But... um, Back in 1964, we've all heard, you heard it, me, if those of you from my other shows, when, uh, with RZ and stuff, and on the, on uh, HOV and on uh, Reactionary Speaks, when I had spoke of this, we, we always talked of Paul Harvey and if I were the devil, and but we overlooked something. There, there was another deal here that we should have heeded a warning at the same time. Now this, remember, this is from that same period of time. This is like 66, 67 when this one came out, Freedom to Chains. Freedom to Chains. And here we are all these years later, and nobody heeded the warning. Now then, what makes a nation strong? Taxes? (laughs) There's nothing new about those either. The first income tax was paid by Abraham. It was written on a rock by the hand of divinity and handed to Moses at the top of Mount Sinai. And you might want to remember this. It was at the flat rate of 10%. It promised the wrath of God on anybody who tampered with or violated that law. Christ was born in Bethlehem because Joseph was on his way to pay his taxes. Joseph was a relatively well-to-do landowner of the house and lineage of David. Yet the taxes exacted by Caesar Augustus were so exorbitant that he didn't have enough money left over to employ a trusted messenger for the mission, so though his wife was great with child, he made the journey himself. And Christ was born in Bethlehem because Joseph was on his way to pay his taxes. And Christ was born in a manger because there was a housing shortage when he got there. Our problems are not new. At Runnymede, the Magna Carta was handed to King John on the end of a sword denying to royalty the right of unlimited taxation. 
Yet you know it was for us, the American people, to become the first in recorded history ever voluntarily to surrender our rights to private property? Oh, yes, we did. With an innocent-sounding constitutional amendment, the 16th, which says that Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived. And we forgot to put any limit on the extent to which we could tax ourselves. Conceivably, we could be taxed out of all private property. We could be taxed not 70%, 80%, 90%, but 100%. We could awaken one morning and find that the government owns the farm and the house and the car and has a mortgage on the church, legally. Historically, whenever any nation has taxed its people more than 25% of their national income, initiative was destroyed and that nation was headed for economic eclipse. Well, presently, the American people are being taxed 33% of their total income. History says we'll roll forward on momentum for a little while, but we'd better get some more gas in the tank pretty quick. You see, ours is not the first by George good government to arise on the world stage. There have been several. Rome, and Spain, and Greece, and China, and each enjoyed about 150 years at its zenith. That's just about our time in the New World. And then each decayed away. Not one of them was ever destroyed by anybody else's marching legions. Each rotted away, morally, socially, culturally, economically, simultaneously. You know, one of the most cruel paradoxes of history is this. Because each was a good government, it bore bountiful fruit. And when it bore bountiful fruit, the people got fat. And when they got fat, they got lazy. And when they got lazy, they began to want to absolve themselves of personal responsibility and turn over to government to do for them things which traditionally they had been doing for themselves. At first, there appears to be nothing wrong asking government to perform some extra service for you, but if you ask government for extra services, government, in order to perform its increasing function, has to get bigger, right? And as government gets bigger, in order to support its increasing size, it has to what? Tax the individual more, so the individual gets littler. And to collect the increased taxes requires more tax collectors, so the government gets bigger in order to pay the additional tax collectors. It has to tax the individual more, so the government gets bigger and the individual gets littler. And the government gets bigger and the individual gets littler until the government is all-powerful. The individual is hardly anything at all. The government is all-powerful. The people are cattle. Now, some believe that the need is for a vigorous, strong man to arise on the scene to regulate and regiment the affairs of men. Yet history tells us there have been several such. Once upon a time, there was a nation great and powerful and good. She was suffering from the aftermath of war, from a depression. And then came upon the scene a leader, an idealist, self-confident, intolerant of criticism. Wisely, he limited his early activities to combating the financial depression. Nobody could argue with that. But in a while, he began to regulate business and establish new rules to govern commerce and finance. Some of them in diametrical disagreement with the God-made laws of supply and demand, but anybody who disagreed with those new rules was promptly fired. The new leader saw that under the old system of free enterprise, landlords prospered, so he levied new taxes to take away their profits and destroy what he called the monopoly of capital. To please laborers, he controlled prices. To win the favor of the farmers, he gave them loans and subsidies. The national debt mounted alarmingly. Whenever anybody tried to tell him that governments, even as people, can go broke when they spend beyond their incomes, he said they just didn't understand deficit finance. Well, what do you say? Did he build on rock or on sand? I say on sand. For you see, this was the story of Emperor Tsu Tung Po, who led China to its doom more than a thousand years ago. I am satisfied with all my heart that if Uncle Sam ever does get whipped, here too, it will have been an inside job. It was internal decay, it was not external attack that destroyed the Roman Empire. Starting about 146 B.C., internal conditions in Rome were characterized by a welter of class wars and conflicts, street brawls, corrupt governors, lack of personal integrity and moral responsibility. About 290 years after Christ, a Roman emperor named Diocletian took over. 
He really grabbed the bull by the horns. He took over in a period of turmoil and severe depression. The first thing Diocletian did was call in the gold and close the banks and raise the taxes. He reduced the power of the Senate, delegated its power to a lot of little government bureaus. Do you know they even had a transportation act back there prescribing the fee required to rent one laden ass per mile? And at today's rate of exchange, it would have amounted to about one-eighth cent per mile which meant that in order to make a profit, a jackass would have to carry five passengers? That was simply beyond the capacity of the jackass. Diocletian put millions of people on the public payroll, but when this failed to do the job, the country was still in trouble. He asked more personal powers for himself. For a brief while, incidentally, they were standby powers, but then he used them all at once. He froze wages, he froze prices, he froze jobs, he stopped profits, he dictated to the farmer what he should plant, when and how he should sell it, and for how much, and he rationed food. And what happened? The labor market closed down. Incentive was gone. Farm life became dependent on bureaucratic red tape. Exorbitant taxes cost the farmer his land. He kept for himself only a small plot on which he might grow turnips for his family. He lost the rest of it to the state. And without food and with incentive gone, city life stagnated and declined. And Rome passed into what history has recorded as the Dark Ages, lasting a thousand years. Just by turning to the left, the world has gone in circles. A nation would evolve from a monarchy into an oligarchy, from oligarchy to dictatorship, from dictatorship to bureaucracy, from bureaucracy to pure democracy, where finally the people would cry out from the chaos and confusion of the streets, oh, please, God, give us a king, and God would give them a king, and they'd have a monarchy again and start the whole silly cycle anew. Now, either we will profit from the errors of their ways, or it follows as the night, the day, our children are going to have to relive the dark ages all over again. How come after thousands of years of experiment, our new nation has come so far, so fast? All this in less than 200 years. What is the secret of our success? Well, I think it had to do with a basic American's creed. Perhaps it never passed the pioneer's lips in this form, but if it had, I think he would have said something like this. I believe in my God, in my country, and in myself. I know that sounds like a trite, too simple thing to say, and yet it's a rare man today who will dare to stand up and say, I believe in my God and my country and in myself, and in that order. When the early American pioneer first turned his eyes toward the West, there were only Indian trails or traces, as they were called, for him to follow through the wilderness. Do you know today you can roller skate from Miami to Seattle, from San Diego to Plymouth Rock? In this little bitty instant, as historical time has measured, our 7% of the Earth's population has come to possess more than half of all the world's good things. How come? Well, sir, when that early pioneer turned his eyes toward the West, he didn't demand that somebody else look after him. He didn't demand a free education. He didn't demand a guaranteed rocking chair at eventide. He didn't demand that somebody else take care of him if he got ill or got old. There was an old-fashioned philosophy in those days that a man was supposed to provide for his own and for his own future. He didn't demand a maximum amount of money for a minimum amount of work. Nor did he expect pay for no work at all. Come to think of it, he didn't demand anything. That hard-handed pioneer just looked out there at the rolling plains, stretching away to the tall green mountains, and then lifted his eyes to the blue skies and said, Thank you, God. Now I can take it from here. Now that spirit isn't dead in our country. It's dormant. It's been discredited in some circles, driven underground, but it isn't dead. It's just that a few seasons ago, politicians baiting their hooks with free barbecue and trading a Ponzi promise for votes, began telling us we don't want opportunity anymore, we want security. We don't want opportunity, they said, we want security. And they said it so often we came to believe them, we wanted security. And they gave us chains, and we were secure. Suddenly, with our constitutional guarantees depleted, with our national character eroding away, with our tax laws penalizing those who dare to prosper, with workers concentrating on how little they can get by with instead of how much they can produce, suddenly we looked overhead one day to discover that the first tin moon in space was a Russian accomplishment. 
that free men dragging their feet had been outdistanced by slave workers dragging their chains, and we were sore afraid. Perhaps this was a disguised blessing, too. Maybe a dramatic accomplishment by this Cold War adversary was necessary to get us off our dead centers and back to work again. If we can revive in ourselves, then in our youth, something of that basic American's creed, the horizon has never, ever been so limitless. For man stands now on the threshold of his highest adventure of all, his first faltering footsteps into space. Twenty years from today, half of the products you will be using in your everyday living aren't even in the dictionary yet. We've got it made. If we just keep on keeping on, we've got it made. And if we don't, we will follow those other great nation states of history into the graveyard of ignominious oblivion. History promises only this for certain. We will get exactly what we deserve. And how true that is. We will get exactly what we deserve. Now, as as Paul Harvey was talking here, you see he came all the way up through everything that man had done to themselves. The first time I ever listened to this clip and he starts talking, I, when he starts talking of the Chinese emperor that tore down China a thousand years ago, I thought at first he was talking of America. We're coming out of World War II. We we had a depression, and the people were bowing, and the government just kept, kept taking more and more and more and more power. But he wasn't. But now, if you put the same perspective in what happened to our church today, what happened to the religion of today, what has people put forth instead of the truth? They've put forth security. Security in, well, I ain't going to be here. They've allowed the true teachings of God to be watered down. They gave forth their will to learn over to someone else. And now they are taking that at blind faith. And we saw the result of that if you take a look around today within our society. So it brings on what is coming here in when you take Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 gets into a little bit more of what this sealed book is all about. So let's take a quick look here and read down through the start of Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who was worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look therein. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book. He sees this book, and he's he's weeping. It's like... What this tells us as sinners here upon the earth, and even as John is seeing this vision in heaven, he's standing before the throne in heaven, and he that sits upon the throne is holding this book, and there's nobody. There's nobody. you got 24 elders who were commissioned to sit in heaven right now today as we speak here tonight. They are there before the throne of God with the four beasts, and nobody, but nobody, can open this book. Nobody has the authority. Nobody is pure enough. That's what he's saying here. None of us are there. We're in the ground. Those that are dead are in the ground. Those that are living here, we are. 
We're not there. Nobody, but nobody is worthy to look upon this book. And that bothers him. That disturbs him. And he weeps. And he thinks, here is this book. And we'll... No one's going to know. We, we have no idea. How can, I, how can I write what I bear record to up here in heaven and I can't even see it? Nobody can open it. So now we come into the next, the rest of Revelation chapter 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard a voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. And the four beasts say, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down, and worshipped he that liveth forever and ever. Now this is very telling. We heard in the start of chapter 5, there is nobody, there is nobody alive on the earth, there is nobody dead in the earth, there is nobody dead in the sea, there is nobody in heaven. You have angels numbered 10,000 times 10,000 and the thousands of thousands, more than the multitude of a comprehension that people can count and number. And nobody but the Lamb that overcometh. The Lamb that overcometh, we know the, the Lamb of the tribe of Judah. This is Christ himself. Christ overcame the world. Christ overcame the world when he walked upon the earth. He was tempted for 40 days by Satan, and he still refused to bow down to man's ways, and he stuck true and pure to his Father as he was supposed to. And he was crucified, and his blood cleansed every sin for us. It's all forgiven. The next step is ours. You see here that, and they're saying, for everybody. Now, the multitudes that are in heaven, the angels, the 24 elders, the four beasts, they're all worshiping the lamb that was slain, as he was slain. This is what he brings forth. John is, is happy. He's now, he's seeing, okay, there is somebody that is qualified, but only the one, only one has so far overcome the earth, and that is Jesus. 
He overcame. He was crucified. He was resurrected. He was put upon his throne at the right hand of God. And his kingdom, which is the church, has gone forth ever since. Now, he is deemed worthy to open this book, to open these seals, to look upon with what is is in it. And you see that, again, you hear of just that. You hear of the angels. You hear of the the elders and the amen, and they're worshiping, and they're saying they know that the time is at hand. The time is at hand. Everything up until now has been for a reason. We have come to a point in time when basically, like I have said before, in in my way of of saying things, in just being a, a typical sinner here upon earth, is God's fed up. We were told what will come to pass. We were told what was going to happen. We were told there will be wrong teachers. We were told there will be false prophets. We were warned of the powers given unto a government as the authority upon our lives. And we can see that right to today, ladies and gentlemen. We are, as a nation, $20 trillion in debt. As you heard in that clip from Paul Harvey, when you question that, what do we get today? You just do not understand deficit spending. Well, yeah, I do. I do understand deficit spending. You overspend your means and revenue this year, and it goes into debt. The next year, you do it again, and it goes into debt. And then you do it again next year, and it goes into debt. And through the middle of the year, if you have not budgeted for something, you just pull money out of nowhere and you spend it and that becomes debt. That's pretty simple to figure out deficit spending now, isn't it? Somewhere along the line, somebody's going to have to pay that back. It's the same thing in your life. How long is a bank going to support you? How long is a family member or a business going to support you when you continually to spend more than you make? We saw that in the great crash here of 2008 and 9. When the real, so-called real estate bubble popped, at that point, many companies, as with the roof trust factory that I worked at, They found themselves $25 million in debt. We're all done. You just keep borrowing more and more and more and more, and it doesn't end. Your company is not growing. Your company is not becoming profitable again. You have allowed unions to take over your company, which are costing you millions of dollars a year for nothing. At one point, ladies and gentlemen, Do you think the people that were in this company had any inclination of what God wanted when they were faking illnesses and ailments to walk around the shop all day on what they called light duty? Out of 165 employees, production employees within this one plant, At one time, ladies and gentlemen, we had 65 people on three shifts showing up, getting full pay to do nothing. They couldn't. Their back hurt, their leg hurt, their arm hurt, this hurt, that hurt. And it was nothing. They did nothing. Now, The Bible has always taught us a fair day's wage for a fair day's labor. As a Christian now, and knowing this Bible the way I am learning this Bible and what God asks of me. Son, take what you did to yourself. Take the cause, the effect, and now if you want to listen to me and you want to follow me, Listen to me, and I will help you of what you can do from here on out. 
I did not come back to this show, ladies and gentlemen, easily. I, I didn't. Um, you can ask the wife. I, I fought tooth and nail. I fought myself tooth and nail. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I had more excuses than, well, a politician. But I chose instead, ladies and gentlemen, to swallow my pride, put my faith in God, and ask God, if this is what you want me to do, then help me, please. If I'm going to pay dearly after a two-hour show, then I'm going to pay dearly. I'm going to do it. That's my sacrifice. I can deal with that. I'll do that. If I'm going to be winded as I am now, I'm getting pretty winded. It's been a long day. But I chose to do this. And I think more people have, there's a truth out there, ladies and gentlemen, that we need to have. As you heard Gary McDade in the first hour, of if you're going to sit down with this Bible and you're going to come up with your own theory and you're going to, anybody can dig through the Bible and you will find what it says to support your theory. But is that theory the truth? Is that is that theory what other people should be hearing? Well, that you have to ask God. I I don't I don't want to lie to people. I don't want to mislead people. I will give them both views of what it says. But when I can see a true falsehood being told to the people I'm going to speak up. Don't tell me that come up hither is the rapture when I can look right at it and see that it's John saying, and I saw and I heard saying unto me. Well, don't insult my intelligence. But don't. But don't look down upon me because I will speak what I see right before me, written in the Bible. If you don't want to hear it, then okay, then go. But don't think I'm going to allow you to come stand in front of me and chastise me and attack me because how dare you say that to people in public. And this is where we've come to today, ladies and gentlemen, that... Before next week, when I, Revelation chapter 6 really starts to bring down, you can call it the wrath of God. You can call it whatever you want to call it. But when Jesus starts to open these seven seals, you best be hanging on. Because you will realize that we are in the 10th level of hell at that time. We're coming there right now. Nobody can convince me that we are not in some form of tribulation at this time. Do you think any church today, many churches today, would, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) allow me to stand up and say this to their congregation? Hey, you guys are being misled. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says this. Of course not. And at the same time, I wouldn't expect a church to do it because it's not my place. I don't feel at that point it is my place to stand up and try to shame the leadership or whatever within that church because God will do that on his own. Do you think that the whole problem with the pedophiles and the child molestations and stuff that went on in the in the Catholic Church who do you think exposed that to the world God did every time you see a pastor or a preacher or something like that of that nature go down in the limelight of this sexual immorality who exposed that God did God put something forth out there that people that that people picked up and said wow because we have to look at one thing we know that the 
The bride of Christ is the people within the church. His church will be cleansed and purified in the end time. So all these indiscrepancies that are within our churches today, God will cleanse the world, the, the churches of it. He will expose this in his time, in his way. And yes, as a Christian, it's hard for us, but we have to let him do it. And if we have to move on to another church or another venue or another, as this is what I've chose to do, ladies and gentlemen, I, I enjoy doing this. And I now I have seen that I can do this. I, I had to swallow my own pride and my own, I can't do it, my own excuses. I I am very glad to be back on Friday nights with my great friend RZ and the great panelists and the great people from the Halls of Valhalla Network, HOV. So I guess what I'm asking of, of all of you out here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is maybe to do the same. Maybe take and look into your own heart. Look into your own self and what is it that you can do to help yourself, help your family, possibly help another that is lost? Someone that is, that they're seeking the answers. They're seeking the answers. And if, don't be afraid to if you do not know the answer to something, do not guess. Be humble enough to tell this person, I am not sure on that, and I will look into it. It's the same with me. If somebody were to call in here and to ask me a question, and it's something that I had not studied, it's something that I was not sure of, then I... I would be humbled enough to tell them that. And if you give me some time, I can go research it and I can bring forth to you what I see and maybe two or three opinions of other people of what they see. And maybe together we can find the truth. And that so that when it comes the time and we are judged before God, all we can do is hope that we have been deemed worthy. Because in this study, throughout, by the time we get to the end of the book of Revelation, we will, it is all laid out for us. What heaven will be, what all of it will be, as John was told. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say as always, God bless you. God bless America. And until next time, God willing, this is no way out.